The Door in the Wall, a short story about choices by H.G. Wells. One confidential evening, not three months ago, Lionel Wallace told me this story of The Door in the Wall, and at the time I thought that so far as he was concerned it was a true story. He told it me with such a direct simplicity of conviction that I could not do otherwise than believe in him. But in the morning, in my own flat, I woke to a different atmosphere, and as I lay in bed and recalled the things he had told me, stripped of the glamour of his earnest, slow voice, denuded of the focused, shaded table light, the shadowy atmosphere that wrapped about him and the pleasant, bright things, the dessert and glasses and napery of the dinner we had shared, making them for the time a bright little world quite cut off from everyday realities, I saw it all as frankly incredible. He was mystifying, I said, and then, how well he did it. It isn't quite the thing I should have expected him, of all people, to do well. Afterwards, as I sat up in bed and sipped my morning tea, I found myself trying to account for the flavour of reality that perplexed me in his impossible reminiscences, by supposing they did in some way suggest, present, convey, I hardly know which word to use, experiences it was otherwise impossible to tell. Well, I don't resort to that explanation now. I have got over my intervening doubts. I believe now, as I believed at the moment of telling, that Wallace did to the very best of his ability strip the truth of his secret for me. But whether he himself saw, or only thought he saw, whether he himself was the possessor of an inestimable privilege, or the victim of a fantastic dream, I cannot pretend to guess. Even the facts of his death, which ended my doubts forever, throw no light on that. That much the reader must judge for himself. I forget now what chance comment or criticism of mine moved so reticent a man to confide in me. He was, I think, defending himself against an imputation of slackness and unreliability I had made in relation to a great public movement in which he had disappointed me. But he plunged suddenly. I have, he said, a preoccupation. I know, he went on, after a pause that he devoted to the study of his cigar ash. I have been negligent. The fact is, it isn't a case of ghosts or apparitions, but it's an odd thing to tell of, Redmond. I am haunted. I am haunted by something that rather takes the light out of things, that fills me with longings. He paused, checked by that English shyness that so often overcomes us when we would speak of moving or grave or beautiful things. You were at St. Athelstan's all through, he said, and for a moment that seemed to me quite irrelevant. Well, and he paused. Then very haltingly at first, but afterwards more easily, he began to tell of the thing that was hidden in his life, the haunting memory of a beauty and a happiness that filled his heart with insatiable longings that made all the interests and spectacle of worldly life seem dull and tedious and vain to him. Now that I have the clue to it, the thing seems written visibly in his face. I have a photograph in which that look of detachment has been caught and intensified. It reminds me of what a woman once said of him, a woman who had loved him greatly. Suddenly, she said, the interest goes out of him. He forgets you. He doesn't care a rap for you, under his very nose. Yet the interest was not always out of him, and when he was holding his attention to a thing Wallace could contrive to be an extremely successful man, his career, indeed, is set with successes. He left me behind him long ago. He soared up over my head and cut a figure in the world that I couldn't cut, anyhow. He was still a year short of forty, and they say now that he would have been in office and very probably in the new cabinet if he had lived. At school, he always beat me without effort, as it were by nature. We were at school together at St. Athelstan's College in West Kensington for almost all our school time. He came into the school as my co-equal, but he left far above me in a blaze of scholarships and brilliant performance. Yet I think I made a fair average running. And it was at school I heard first of the door in the wall that I was to hear of a second time only a month before his death. To him, at least, the door in the wall was a real door leading through a real wall to immortal realities. Of that I am now quite assured. And it came into his life early, 
when he was a little fellow between five and six. I remember how, as he sat making his confession to me with a slow gravity, he reasoned and reckoned the date of it. There was, he said, a crimson Virginia creeper in it, all one bright uniform crimson in a clear amber sunshine against a white wall. That came into the impression somehow, though I don't clearly remember how, and there were horse chestnut leaves upon the clean pavement outside the green door. They were blotched yellow and green, you know, not brown nor dirty, so that they must have been new fallen. I take it that means October. I look out for horse chestnut leaves every year, and I ought to know. If I'm right in that, I was about five years and four months old. He was, he said, rather a precocious little boy. He learned to talk at an abnormally early age, and he was so sane and old-fashioned, as people say, that he was permitted an amount of initiative that most children scarcely attain by seven or eight. His mother died when he was born, and he was under the less vigilant and authoritative care of a nursery governess. His father was a stern, preoccupied lawyer who gave him little attention and expected great things of him. For all his brightness he found life a little grey and dull, I think, and one day he wandered. He could not recall the particular neglect that enabled him to get away, nor the course he took among the West Kensington roads. All that had faded among the incurable blurs of memory. But the white wall and the green door stood out quite distinctly. As his memory of that remote, childish experience ran, he did at the very first sight of that door experience a peculiar emotion, an attraction, a desire to get to the door and open it and walk in. And at the same time, he had the clearest conviction that either it was unwise or it was wrong of him. He could not tell which to yield to this attraction. He insisted upon it as a curious thing that he knew from the very beginning, unless memory has played him the queerest trick, that the door was unfastened and that he could go in as he chose. I seemed to see the figure of that little boy, drawn and repelled, and it was very clear in his mind too, though why it should be so was never explained, that his father would be very angry if he went through that door. Wallace described all these moments of hesitation to me with the utmost particularity. He went right past the door, and then, with his hands in his pockets and making an infantile attempt to whistle, strolled right along beyond the end of the wall. There he recalls a number of mean, dirty shops, and particularly that of a plumber and decorator with a dusty disorder of earthenware pipes, sheet-lead ball taps, pattern books of wallpaper, and tins of enamel. He stood pretending to examine these things, and coveting, passionately desiring the green door. Then, he said, he had a gust of emotion. He made a run for it, lest hesitation should grip him again. He went plump with outstretched hand through the green door and let it slam behind him. And so, in a trice, he came into the garden that has haunted all his life. It was very difficult for Wallace to give me his full sense of that garden into which he came. There was something in the very air of it that exhilarated, that gave one a sense of lightness and good happening and well-being. There was something in the sight of it that made all its colour clean and perfect and subtly luminous. In the instant of coming into it, one was exquisitely glad, as only in rare moments, and when one is young and joyful, one can be glad in this world. And everything was beautiful there, Wallace mused before he went on telling me. You see, he said, with the doubtful inflection of a man who pauses at incredible things, there were two great panthers there, yes, spotted panthers, and I was not afraid. There was a long, wide path with marble-edged flower borders on either side, and these two huge velvety beasts were playing there with a ball. One looked up and came towards me, a little curious as it seemed. It came right up to me, rubbed its soft round ear very gently against the small hand I held out and purred. It was, I tell you, an enchanted garden. I know. And the size. Oh. It stretched far and wide, this way and that. I believe there were hills far away. Heaven knows where West Kensington had suddenly got to, and somehow it was just like coming home. You know, in the very moment the door swung to behind me, 
I forgot the road with its fallen chestnut leaves, its cabs and tradesmen's carts. I forgot the sort of gravitational pullback to the discipline and obedience of home. I forgot all hesitations and fear, forgot discretion, forgot all the intimate realities of this life. I became in a moment a very glad and wonder-happy little boy, in another world. It was a world with a different quality, a warmer, more penetrating and mellower light, with a faint, clear gladness in its air, and wisps of sun-touched cloud in the blueness of its sky. And before me ran this long, wide path, invitingly, with weedless beds on either side, rich with untended flowers, and these two great panthers. I put my little hands fearlessly on their soft fur, and caressed their round ears, and the sensitive corners under their ears, and played with them, and it was as though they welcomed me home. There was a keen sense of homecoming in my mind, and when presently a tall, fair girl appeared in the pathway, and came to meet me, smiling, and said, Well? To me, and lifted me, and kissed me, and put me down, and led me by the hand. There was no amazement, but only an impression of delightful rightness, of being reminded of happy things that had in some strange way been overlooked. There were broad steps, I remember, that came into view between spikes of delphinium, and up these we went to a great avenue between very old and shady dark trees. All down this avenue, you know, between the red-chapped stems, were marble seats of honour and statuary, and very tame and friendly white doves. And along this avenue, my girlfriend led me, looking down, I recall the pleasant lines, the finely modelled chin of her sweet, kind face, asking me questions in a soft, agreeable voice, and telling me things, pleasant things I know, though what they were I was never able to recall. And presently, a little capuchin monkey, very clean, with a fur of ruddy brown and kindly hazel eyes, came down a tree to us and ran beside me, looking up at me and grinning, and presently leapt to my shoulder. So we went on our way in great happiness. He paused. Go on, I said. I remember little things. We passed an old man musing among laurels, I remember, and a place gay with parroquets, and came through a broad shaded colonnade to a spacious cool palace, full of pleasant fountains, full of beautiful things full of the quality and promise of heart's desire. And there were many things and many people, some that still seem to stand out clearly, and some that are a little vague, but all these people were beautiful and kind. In some way, I don't know how, it was conveyed to me that they all were kind to me, glad to have me there, and filling me with gladness by their gestures, by the touch of their hands, by the welcome and love in their eyes. Yes, he mused for a while. Playmates I found there. That was very much to me, because I was a lonely little boy. They played delightful games in a grass covered court where there was a sundial set about with flowers, and as one played, one loved. But it's odd. There's a gap in my memory. I don't remember the games we played. I never remembered. Afterwards, as a child, I spent long hours trying, even with tears, to recall the form of that happiness. I wanted to play it all over again, in my nursery, by myself. No, all I remember is the happiness and two dear playfellows who were most with me. Then presently came a sombre, dark woman with a grave, pale face and dreamy eyes, a sombre woman wearing a soft, long robe of pale purple who carried a book and beckoned and took me aside with her into a gallery above a hall, though my playmates were loth to have me go, and ceased their game and stood watching as I was carried away. Come back to us, they cried. Come back to us soon. I looked up at her face, but she heeded them not at all. Her face was very gentle and grave. She took me to a seat in the gallery, and I stood beside her, ready to look at her book as she opened it upon her knee. The pages fell open. She pointed, and I looked, marvelling, for in the living pages of that book I saw myself. It was a story about myself, and in it were all the things that had happened to me since ever I was born. It was wonderful to me, 
because the pages of that book were not pictures, you understand, but realities. Wallace paused gravely, looked at me doubtfully. Go on, I said. I understand. They were realities. Yes, they must have been. People moved and things came and went in them. My dear mother, whom I had near forgotten. Then my father, stern and upright, the servants, the nursery, all the familiar things of home. Then the front door and the busy streets, with traffic to and fro. I looked and marvelled and looked half doubtfully again into the woman's face and turned the pages over, skipping this and that, to see more of this book and more, and so at last I came to myself hovering and hesitating outside the green door in the long white wall and felt again the conflict and the fear. And next, I cried, and would have turned on, but the cool hand of the grave woman delayed me. Next, I insisted, and struggled gently with her hand, pulling up her fingers with all my childish strength, and as she yielded and the page came over, she bent down upon me like a shadow and kissed my brow. But the page did not show the enchanted garden, nor the panthers, nor the girl who had led me by the hand, nor the playfellows who had been so loth to let me go. It showed a long grey street in West Kensington, on that chill hour of afternoon before the lamps are lit. And I was there, a wretched little figure, weeping aloud for all that I could do to restrain myself, and I was weeping because I could not return to my dear playfellows who had called after me, Come back to us! Come back to us soon! I was there. This was no page in a book, but harsh reality. That enchanted place and the restraining hand of the grave mother at whose knee I stood had gone. Whither have they gone? He halted again and remained for a time, staring into the fire. Oh, the wretchedness of that return, he murmured. Well, I said, after a minute or so. Poor little wretch I was, brought back to this grey world again. As I realised the fullness of what had happened to me, I gave way to quite ungovernable grief, and the shame and humiliation of that public weeping and my disgraceful homecoming remain with me still. I see again the benevolent-looking old gentleman in gold spectacles who stopped and spoke to me, prodding me first with his umbrella. Poor little chap, said he, and are you lost then? And me a London boy of five and more, and he must needs bring in a kindly young policeman and make a crowd of me, and so march me home. Sobbing, conspicuous and frightened, I came from the enchanted garden to the steps of my father's house. That is as well as I can remember my vision of that garden, the garden that haunts me still. Of course, I can convey nothing of that indescribable quality of translucent unreality, that difference from the common things of experience that hung about it all. But that, that is what happened. If it was a dream, I am sure it was a daytime and altogether extraordinary dream. Hmm. Naturally, there followed a terrible questioning by my aunt, my father, the nurse, the governess, everyone. I tried to tell them, and my father gave me my first thrashing for telling lies. When afterwards I tried to tell my aunt, she punished me again for my wicked persistence. Then, as I said, everyone was forbidden to listen to me, to hear a word about it. Even my fairy tale books were taken away from me for a time, because I was too imaginative. Eh? Yes, they did that. My father belonged to the old school, and my story was driven back upon myself. I whispered it to my pillow, my pillow that was often damp and salt to my whispering lips with childish tears, and I added always to my official and less fervent prayers this one heartfelt request, Please, God, I may dream of the garden. Oh, take me back to my garden. Take me back to my garden. I dreamt often of the garden. I may have added to it. I may have changed it. I do not know. All this, you understand, is an attempt to reconstruct from fragmentary memories a very early experience. Between that and the other consecutive memories of my boyhood, there is a gulf. A time came when it seemed impossible I should ever speak of that wonder glimpse again. I asked an obvious question. No, he said, I don't remember that I ever attempted to find my way back to the garden in those early years. This seems odd to me now, 
but I think that very probably a closer watch was kept on my movements after this misadventure to prevent my going astray. No, it wasn't until you knew me that I tried for the garden again, and I believe there was a period, incredible as it seems now, when I forgot the garden altogether. When I was about eight or nine, it may have been. Do you remember me as a kid at St. Athelstan's? Rather. I didn't show any signs, did I, in those days of having a secret dream? Two. He looked up with a sudden smile. Did you ever play Northwest Passage with me? No, of course you didn't come my way. It was the sort of game, he went on, that every imaginative child plays all day. The idea was the discovery of a Northwest Passage to school. The way to school was plain enough. The game consisted in finding some way that wasn't plain, starting off ten minutes early in some almost hopeless direction and working one's way round through unaccustomed streets to my goal. And one day I got entangled among some rather low-class streets on the other side of Campton Hill and I began to think that for once the game would be against me and that I should get to school late. I tried rather desperately a street that seemed a cul-de-sac and found a passage at the end. I hurried through that with renewed hope. I shall do it yet, I said, and passed a row of frowsy little shops that were inexplicably familiar to me. And behold, there was my long white wall and the green door that led to the enchanted garden. The thing whacked upon me suddenly. Then, after all, that garden, that wonderful garden, wasn't a dream. He paused. I suppose my second experience with the green door marks the world of difference there is between the busy life of a schoolboy and the infinite leisure of a child. Anyhow, this second time, I didn't for a moment think of going in straight away. You see, for one thing, my mind was full of the idea of getting to school in time, set on not breaking my record for punctuality. I must surely have felt some little desire at least to try the door. Yes, I must have felt that but I seem to remember the attraction of the door mainly as another obstacle to my overmastering determination to get to school. I was immediately interested by this discovery I had made, of course. I went on with my mind full of it, but I went on. It didn't check me. I ran past, tugging out my watch, found I had ten minutes still to spare, and then I was going downhill into familiar surroundings. I got to school, breathless, it is true, and wet with perspiration, but in time, I can remember hanging up my coat and hat, went right by it and left it behind me. Odd, eh? He looked at me thoughtfully. Of course, I didn't know then that it wouldn't always be there. Schoolboys have limited imaginations. I suppose I thought it was a jolly thing to have it there, to know my way back to it, but there was the school tugging at me. I expect I was a good deal distraught and inattentive that morning, recalling what I could of the beautiful strange people I should presently see again. Oddly enough, I had no doubt in my mind that they would be glad to see me. Yes, I must have thought of the garden that morning, just as a jolly sort of place to which one might resort in the interludes of a strenuous scholastic career. I didn't go that day at all. The next day was a half-holiday, and that may have weighed with me. Perhaps, too, my state of inattention brought down impositions upon me and docked the margin of time necessary for the detour. I don't know. What I do know is that in the meantime the enchanted garden was so much upon my mind that I could not keep it to myself. I told. What was his name? A ferrety-looking youngster we used to call Squiff. Young Hopkins, said I. Hopkins it was. I did not like telling him. I had a feeling that in some way it was against the rules to tell him, but I did. He was walking part of the way home with me. He was talkative, and if we had not talked about the enchanted garden, we should have talked of something else, and it was intolerable to me to think about any other subject. So I blabbed. Well, he told my secret. The next day in the play interval, I found myself surrounded by half a dozen bigger boys, half teasing and wholly curious to hear more of the enchanted garden. There was that big Fawcett, you remember him, and Carnaby and Morley Reynolds. You weren't there by any chance. No, I think I should have remembered if you were. A boy is a creature of odd feelings, 
I was, I really believe, in spite of my secret self-disgust, a little flattered to have the attention of these big fellows. I remember particularly a moment of pleasure caused by the praise of Crawshaw. You remember Crawshaw Major, the son of Crawshaw the composer, who said it was the best lie he had ever heard. But at the same time there was a really painful undertow of shame at telling what I felt was indeed a sacred secret. That beast Fawcett made a joke about the girl in green. Mo Wallace's voice sank with the keen memory of that shame. I pretended not to hear, he said. Well, then Carnaby suddenly called me a young liar and disputed with me when I said the thing was true. I said I knew where to find the green door, could lead them all there in ten minutes. Carnaby became outrageously virtuous and said I'd have to, and bear out my words or suffer. Did you ever have Carnaby twist your arm? Then perhaps you'll understand how it went with me. I swore my story was true. There was nobody in the school then to save a chap from Carnaby, though Crawshaw put in a word or so. Carnaby had got his game. I grew excited and red-eared and a little frightened. I behaved altogether like a silly little chap, and the outcome of it all was that instead of starting alone for my enchanted garden, I led the way presently, cheeks flushed, ears hot, eyes smarting, and my soul one burning misery and shame for a party of six mocking, curious and threatening schoolfellows. We never found the white wall and the green door. You mean? I mean I couldn't find it. I would have found it if I could. And afterwards, when I could go alone, I couldn't find it. I never found it. I seem now to have been always looking for it through my schoolboy days, but I've never come upon it again. Did the fellows make it disagreeable? Beastly. Carnaby held a council over me for wanton lying. I remember how I sneaked home and upstairs to hide the marks of my blubbering, but when I cried myself to sleep at last it wasn't for Carnaby, but for the garden for the beautiful afternoon I had hoped for, for the sweet, friendly women and the waiting playfellows, and the game I had hoped to learn again, that beautiful, forgotten game. I believed firmly that if I had not told, I had bad times after that, crying at night and wool gathering by day. For two terms I slackened and had bad reports. Do you remember? Of course you would. It was you, your beating me in mathematics that brought me back to the grind again. 3. For a time, my friend stared silently into the red heart of the fire. Then he said, I never saw it again until I was seventeen. It leapt upon me for the third time, as I was driving to Paddington on my way to Oxford and a scholarship. I had just one momentary glimpse. I was leaning over the apron of my hansom smoking a cigarette, and no doubt thinking myself no end of a man of the world, and suddenly there was the door, the wall, the dear sense of unforgettable and still attainable things. We clattered by, I too taken by surprise to stop my cab until we were well past and round a corner. Then I had a queer moment, a double and divergent movement of my will. I tapped the little door in the roof of the cab and brought my arm down to pull out my watch. Yes, sir, said the cabman smartly. Er, uh, well, it's nothing, I cried. My mistake. We haven't much time. Go on. And he went on. I got my scholarship. And the night after I was told of that, I sat over my fire in my little upper room, my study, in my father's house, with his praise, his rare praise, and his sound counsels ringing in my ears, and I smoked my favourite pipe, the formidable bulldog of adolescence, and thought of that door in the long white wall. If I had stopped, I thought. I should have missed my scholarship, I should have missed Oxford, muddled all the fine career before me, I begin to see things better. I fell musing deeply, but I did not doubt then this career of mine was a thing that merited sacrifice. Those dear friends and that clear atmosphere seemed very sweet to me, very fine, but remote. My grip was fixing now upon the world. I saw another door opening, the door of my career. He stared again into the fire. Its red lights picked out a stubborn strength in his face for just one flickering moment, and then it vanished again. Well, he said and sighed, I have served that career. I have done much work, much hard work. 
but I have dreamt of the enchanted garden a thousand dreams and seen its door, or at least glimpsed its door, four times since then. Yes, four times. For a while this world was so bright and interesting, seemed so full of meaning and opportunity, that the half-effaced charm of the garden was by comparison gentle and remote. Who wants to pat panthers on the way to dinner with pretty women and distinguished men? I came down to London from Oxford, a man of bold promise that I have done something to redeem. Something, and yet, there have been disappointments. Twice I have been in love. I will not dwell on that. But once, as I went to someone who, I know, doubted whether I dared to come, I took a short cut at a venture through an unfrequented road near Earl's Court, and so happened on a white wall and a familiar green door. Odd, said I to myself, but I thought this place was on Campton Hill. It's the place I never could find somehow, like counting Stonehenge, the place of that queer day dream of mine. And I went by it intent upon my purpose. It had no appeal to me that afternoon. I had just a moment's impulse to try the door, Three steps aside were needed at the most, though I was sure enough in my heart that it would open to me, and then I thought that doing so might delay me on the way to that appointment in which I thought my honour was involved. Afterwards I was sorry for my punctuality. I might at least have peeped in, I thought, and waved a hand to those panthers, but I knew enough by this time not to seek again belatedly that which is not found by seeking. Yes. That time made me very sorry. Years of hard work after that, and never a sight of the door. It's only recently it has come back to me. With it, there has come a sense as though some thin tarnish had spread itself over my world. I began to think of it as a sorrowful and bitter thing that I should never see that door again. Perhaps I was suffering a little from overwork. Perhaps it was what I've heard spoken of as the feeling of forty. I don't know but certainly the keen brightness that makes effort easy has gone out of things recently, and that just at a time with all these new political developments, when I ought to be working. Odd, isn't it? But I do begin to find life toilsome, its rewards, as I come near them, cheap. I began a little while ago to want the garden quite badly. Yes, and I've seen it three times. The garden? No, the door, and I haven't gone in. He leaned over the table to me with an enormous sorrow in his voice as he spoke. Thrice I have had my chance. Thrice. If ever that door offers itself to me again, I swore I will go in out of this dust and heat, out of this dry glitter of vanity, out of these toilsome futilities. I will go and never return. This time I will stay. I swore it, and when the time came, I didn't go. Three times in one year have I passed that door and failed to enter. Three times in the last year. The first time was on the night of the Snatch Division, on the Tenants' Redemption Bill, on which the government was saved by a majority of three. You remember? No one on our side, perhaps very few on the opposite side, expected the end that night. Then the debate collapsed like eggshells. I and Hotchkiss were dining with his cousin at Brentford. We were both unpaired and we were called up by telephone and set off at once in his cousin's motor. We got in barely in time, and on the way we passed my wall and door, livid in the moonlight, blotched with hot yellow as the glare of our lamps lit it, but unmistakable. My God, cried I. What? said Hotchkiss. Nothing, I answered, and the moment passed. I've made a great sacrifice, I told the whip as I got in. They all have, he said and hurried by. I do not see how I could have done otherwise then, and the next occasion was as I rushed to my father's bedside to bid that stern old man farewell. Then, too, the claims of life were imperative. But the third time was different. It happened a week ago. It fills me with hot remorse to recall it. I was with Gurkha and Ralph's. It's no secret now you know that I've had my talk with Gurkha. We had been dining at Frobisher's, and the talk had become intimate between us. The question of my place in the reconstructed ministry lay always just over the boundary of the discussion. Yes, yes, that's all settled. It needn't be talked about yet, but there's no reason to keep a secret from you. Yes, 
Thanks, thanks. But let me tell you my story. Then on that night, things were very much in the air. My position was a very delicate one. I was keenly anxious to get some definite word from Gurkha, but was hampered by Ralph's presence. I was using the best power of my brain to keep that light and careless talk not too obviously directed to the point that concerns me. I had to. Ralph's behaviour since has more than justified my caution. Ralph's, I knew, would leave us beyond the Kensington High Street, and then I could surprise Gurkha by a sudden frankness. One has sometimes to resort to these little devices. And then it was that in the margin of my field of vision, I became aware once more of the white wall, the green door before us down the road. We passed it, talking. I passed it. I can still see the shadow of Gurkha's marked profile, his opera hat tilted forward over his prominent nose, the many folds of his neck wrap going before my shadow and Ralph's as we sauntered past. I passed within twenty inches of the door. If I say good night to them and go in, I ask myself, what will happen? And I was all a tingle for that word with Gurkha. I could not answer that question in the tangle of my other problems. They will think me mad, I thought. And suppose I vanish now, amazing disappearance of a prominent politician. That weighed with me. A thousand inconceivably petty worldlinesses weighed with me in that crisis. Then he turned on me with a sorrowful smile and speaking slowly. Here I am, he said. Here I am, he repeated, and my chance has gone from me. Three times in one year the door has been offered me, the door that goes into peace, into delight, into a beauty beyond dreaming, a kindness no man on earth can know and I have rejected it, Redmond, and it has gone. How do you know? I know, I know. I am left now to work it out, to stick to the tasks that held me so strongly when my moments came. You say, I have success, this vulgar, tawdry, irksome, envied thing. I have it. He had a walnut in his big hand. If that was my success, he said, and crushed it, and held it out for me to see. Let me tell you something, Redmond. This loss is destroying me. For two months, for ten weeks nearly now, I have done no work at all, except the most necessary and urgent duties. My soul is full of inappeasable regrets. At nights, when it is less likely I shall be recognized, I go out. I wonder. Yes. I wonder what people would think of that if they knew. A cabinet minister, the responsible head of that most vital of all departments, wandering alone, grieving, sometimes near audibly lamenting, for a door, for a garden. Four. I can see now his rather pallid face, and the unfamiliar sombre fire that had come into his eyes. I see him very vividly tonight. I sit recalling his words, his tones, and last evening's Westminster Gazette still lies on my sofa, containing the notice of his death. At lunch today, the club was busy with him and the strange riddle of his fate. They found his body very early yesterday morning in a deep excavation near East Kensington Station. It is one of two shafts that have been made in connection with an extension of the railway southward. It is protected from the intrusion of the public by a hoarding upon the high road in which a small doorway has been cut for the convenience of some of the workmen who live in that direction. The doorway was left unfastened through a misunderstanding between two gangers, and through it he made his way. My mind is darkened with questions and riddles. It would seem he walked all the way from the house that night. He has frequently walked home during the past session, and so it is. I figure his dark form coming along the late and empty streets, wrapped up, intent. And then did the pale electric lights near the station cheat the rough planking into a semblance of white? Did that fatal, unfastened door awaken some memory? Was there, after all, ever any green door in the wall at all? I do not know. I have told his story as he told it to me, there are times when I believe that Wallace was no more than the victim of the coincidence between a rare but not unprecedented type of hallucination and a careless trap. But that indeed is not my profoundest belief. You may think me superstitious, if you will, and foolish, but indeed I am more than half convinced that he had in truth an abnormal gift, 
and a sense, something, I know not what, that in the guise of wall and door offered him an outlet, a secret and peculiar passage of escape into another and altogether more beautiful world. At any rate, you will say, it betrayed him in the end. But did it betray him? There you touch the inmost mystery of these dreamers, these men of vision and the imagination. We see our world fair and common, the hoarding and the pit. By our daylight standard, he walked out of security into darkness, danger, and death. But did he see like that? H.G. Wells' short story, The Door in the Wall, first published in 1911, is a profound and haunting exploration of the tension between reality and fantasy, the loss of innocence, and the conflict between personal desires and societal expectations. Wells, a master of speculative fiction, uses the narrative to delve into psychological and philosophical themes that resonate deeply with readers. The story centres on Lionel Wallace, a successful politician who is haunted by a recurring vision from his childhood. As a young boy, Wallace discovered a mysterious green door set in a white wall leading to an enchanted garden. This garden, filled with exotic flora, friendly animals and a sense of perfect happiness, represents a lost Eden or paradise. Each time Wallace recounts his experiences in the garden, the reader is invited to question whether the garden is a figment of his imagination, a psychological escape, or a genuine supernatural occurrence. Wells crafts Wallace's narrative as a confessional to his friend Redmond, who serves as both a confident and a skeptical observer. This narrative structure allows Wells to build a sense of ambiguity and tension. Redmond's scepticism mirrors the reader's own doubts about the reality of Wallace's experiences, which are described with vivid detail and emotional intensity. This dual perspective enriches the story, providing a platform for exploring deeper themes of perception and belief. One of the central themes in The Door in the Wall is the conflict between personal fulfillment and societal obligation. Wallace, despite his success, feels a profound sense of loss and longing for the garden. His repeated encounters with the door throughout his life symbolize moments of potential escape and fulfillment that he continually rejects in favor of career advancement and social expectations. This internal conflict highlights the sacrifices individuals make to conform to societal norms and the personal costs of such conformity. Wallace's experiences with the door can also be interpreted as a metaphor for lost opportunities and the inevitable passage of time. The garden represents a world of possibilities and childhood innocence, which becomes increasingly elusive as Wallace grows older. Each sighting of the door brings a painful reminder of what he has lost and what he might have become had he chosen differently. Wells uses this metaphor to evoke a sense of nostalgia and regret, exploring how individuals cope with the choices they make and the paths they forgo. Moreover, the story delves into the theme of memory and the reliability of recollection. Wallace's vivid memories of the garden contrast sharply with the mundanity of his adult life, raising questions about the nature of memory and its impact on one's sense of self. Is Wallace's garden a true memory, an idealized version of a real experience, or a constructed fantasy born from a deep-seated yearning for escape? Wells leaves this question unresolved, inviting readers to ponder the malleability of memory and its role in shaping identity. The enigmatic nature of the green door itself is a powerful symbol in the story. It represents the unknown and the otherworldly, a portal to a realm that defies the logic and constraints of everyday life. For Wallace, the door is a source of both hope and torment. 
It offers a tantalizing glimpse of a different reality, one where he feels a profound sense of belonging and peace. Yet, the door also eludes him, appearing at moments when he is unable to pursue it, reinforcing the theme of unattainable desires. Wells' use of language and imagery in The Door in the Wall is instrumental in creating the story's ethereal and dreamlike quality. The descriptions of the garden are lush and evocative, filled with sensory details that contrast sharply with the drab, mechanical world of Wallace's adulthood. This dichotomy underscores the story's exploration of the human psyche and the struggle to reconcile inner desires with external realities. In the story's conclusion, Wallace's fate remains ambiguous. His final disappearance, presumably through the door in the wall, leaves readers questioning whether he has found his long-sought paradise or succumbed to madness. This open-endedness is a hallmark of Wells's storytelling, encouraging readers to grapple with the narrative's deeper implications long after the story ends. The door in the wall is a masterful exploration of the human condition, blending psychological insight with speculative elements. Through Wallace's poignant tale, Wells examines themes of lost innocence, the conflict between personal desires and societal expectations, and the elusive nature of happiness. The story's enduring appeal lies in its ability to resonate with readers' own experiences of longing and regret, making it a timeless piece of literary fiction.